Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. 400 years ago, a trio of tiny kingdoms were perched on some damp islands off the coast of Europe. Within three short centuries, these islands would become the center of an empire which ruled a quarter of the globe and on which the sun never set. I'm Samuel Hume, a historian of the British Empire, and my podcast, Pax Britannica, follows the people and events that built that empire into a global superpower. Learn the history of the British Empire by listening to Pax Britannica everywhere you find your podcasts, or go to pod.link slash pax. Hi, this is Scott. If you're a fan of the ancient world, please help us get the word out. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and rate the series on iTunes. Thanks again for listening. History is littered with examples of ambitious princes who were told by friends and advisors that things have gotten so bad, all you need to do is show up and everyone will rally to your cause. The majority have their illusion shattered the moment they step ashore. But this time, for once, things went off almost exactly as planned. Demetrius landed in Beritus, modern Beirut, announced his kingship, and before he knew it, allies in the Seleucid court had arrested both the regent Lysias and the ten-year-old king Antiochus V. Demetrius apparently had no interest in meeting them face to face, and passed word to the soldiers to just go ahead and kill them. It was a virtual repeat of what Antiochus IV had done to Demetrius' own infant brother, and proof that behavior that was once unthinkable was rapidly becoming the new norm. So Demetrius was now King Demetrius I and had restored the legitimate Seleucid line going back to the dynasty's founder. Antiochus IV had no more acknowledged heirs, so Demetrius's rule was technically uncontested. But that didn't mean that everyone was jumping for joy. By 162, the usurper faction of Antiochus IV, then Antiochus V with the regent Lysias, had been ruling Syria for 13 years, which meant they'd appointed the majority of current Seleucid officials. Apart from being their legitimate king, all these officials knew about Demetrius was that he'd spent most of his life in Rome which, given their recent bullying tactics, wasn't exactly a ringing endorsement. After being installed in Antioch, Demetrius turned his attention to setting priorities. Antiochus IV had died while trying to reestablish control over the Persian Gulf, so that was clearly still on the agenda. Egypt was embroiled in civil war, one I'll loop back to in a bit, so at least Syria was secure on that front. But, as Granger notes, Demetrius needed an opportunity to assert his power and so convince everyone that he was in control. He presumably knew of the presence in Asia Minor of the senatorial delegation and would wish to impress them, if only so they would go away. After casting about for a suitable target, Demetrius settled on Judea. Two years previously, the regent Lysias had driven the Maccabees from Jerusalem. But otherwise, the rebellion was still active and still a significant threat. In late 162 and early 161, Demetrius sent two separate armies against the Maccabees. In the first case, the Jewish guerrilla fighters melted back into the Gophna hills. 
In the second, they managed to kill its commander, a man named Nicanor. And, as First Maccabees relates, When Nicanor's host saw that he was slain, they cast away their weapons and fled. This was pretty humiliating stuff, especially right out of the gate. But Granger notes that, in the latter engagement, the bulk of the Seleucid army may have been held in reserve to address an emergent threat. As Diodorus Siculus reports, some of the satraps subject to Demetrius regarded his kingship with scant respect. Of these satraps, the most outstanding was a certain Timarchus. Timarchus was a friend of the previous king, Antiochus, and was currently governing Media. From the first moment of Demetrius's return, Timarchus had been sending petitions and bribes to the Roman Senate, in the care of his brother Heracleides, denouncing the new king's rule in pretty outrageous terms. The payoff came back early and strong, as the Senate soon enacted a decree confirming Timarchus as king of Media, in other words, ratifying his independence. As Diodorus relates, emboldened by this decree, Timarchus raised an army of considerable size in Media. He also entered into an alliance against Demetrius with Artaxius, the king of Armenia. So now, in addition to the rebellion in Judea, Demetrius faced threats from both the east and the north. The eastern threat soon became a reality when Timarchus launched an invasion of Babylonia. The city of Babylon was captured, and Timarchus minted coins in the city, proclaiming himself to be great king, similar to the title taken by his contemporary, King Eucronides I of Bactria. Granger suggests that Diodorus' sequence may be off, and it may not have been until after his capture of Babylon that Rome confirmed Timarchus as king of Media. But either way, he had their blessing, and Demetrius was on his own. The Seleucid king gathered his forces, and the two sides clashed near the city of Zugma. The result was a victory for King Demetrius and the death of King Timarchus, though we're far from hearing the last of his brother, Heracleides. Media and Babylonia were reincorporated as Seleucid territories, and the Babylonians supposedly gave Demetrius the nickname Soter, the Savior, in thanks for their city's liberation. After winning this victory, likely in early 160, Demetrius dispatched another army under a commander named Bacchides to put down the Judean rebellion. There's an interesting tidbit recorded in a few sources that sometime during the previous year, Judah Maccabee had written to the Romans requesting an alliance. The Romans had supposedly agreed likely just to annoy Demetrius. So in theory, by attacking the Maccabees, the Seleucids were going to war against Rome. But Demetrius knew from his long experience that such agreements were typically meaningless unless Rome had strong interests in the region, which, at the moment, they did not. Bacchides led the Seleucid army into Judea and set up camp in a strong position. Granger suggests that Seleucid raiding parties ravaged the countryside, compelling the Maccabees to fight en masse, with the battle finally shaping up near the village of Elassa. According to 1st Maccabees, on seeing the size of the Seleucid army, most of the Judean army deserted, leaving 800 Jews facing off against 22,000 Seleucid soldiers. Though Judah tried to repeat his tactic of targeting the Seleucid commander, this time it failed. Judah Maccabee was killed in the battle, and his followers lost heart and fled. His brothers, Jonathan and Simon, reclaimed his body, carried it back to their home village, and interred it in the family tomb. Leveraging their military victory, the Seleucids took steps to ensure the rebellion was well and truly dead. 
First Maccabees notes that then Bacchides chose the wicked men and made them lords of the country. And they made enquiry and search for Judas's friends and brought them unto Bacchides, who took vengeance upon them. Granger notes the establishments of forts and towns to exert Seleucid control over the region. And to snuff out any last remnant of Jewish authority, after the death of the latest Jewish high priest, Demetrius decided to leave the post permanently vacant. So, by 160, King Demetrius I was in firm control of Syria, Coel Syria, Babylonia, and Media. A pretty respectable core. So, let's let him take a rest while we circle back to our other ambitious Macedonian prince, Ptolemy Physcon. Just offshore the previous year, the rebellious Physcon had finally staged his massive naval assault on the island of Cyprus. Though he managed to seize at least some territory, Diodorus reports that the elder Ptolemy soon forced his brother to stand a siege and made him undergo every deprivation, yet did not venture to put him to death. Partly because of his own innate goodness and their family ties, partly through fear of the Romans. He granted him assurances of personal safety and made with him an agreement, according to which Physcon was to rest content with the possession of Cyrenaica. So, as you might guess, everyone was totally satisfied and there was zero chance of any further conflict. But hey, who's ready to visit Anatolia? because we haven't gone up there for a while and we definitely need to catch up. We just talked about the revolt of King Timarchus of Media and mentioned that his brother Heracleides had survived the whole affair. Both brothers had been highly placed in the court of Antiochus IV, with Heracleides acting as royal treasurer. After his brother's defeat by Demetrius, Heracleides traveled to Ephesus in Anatolia. But he didn't go for the history and culture, the sandy beaches, or the banging nightlife. No, Heracleides was looking for a nuclear bomb. You see, Heracleides knew everything and everyone in the previous administration including the dirty semi-secrets that others may have forgotten. A couple episodes back, I mentioned that Antiochus IV had fathered two children by a concubine, or possible second royal wife, named Antiochus with an I, who were called Alexander and Laodice. Sometime after Antiochus IV's death, the family resettled in Ephesus. The boy, Alexander, was only around 8 in 159 BC. But, just like Heracleides' plans, there was plenty of room to grow. As we all know from Ocean's Eleven, any good con needs a few key ingredients. There's the brains, that'd be Heracleides. There's the ringer, that'd be the young Alexander. And there's the backer or money man which means it's time to reintroduce you all to King Eumenes II of Pergamon. So, forget about all these 20-year-old kids sitting around polishing their spears. Eumenes was winning wars and cutting deals back when they were all in short tunics. In 159, he was 61 and had been on the throne for almost four decades, during which Pergamon had remained Anatolia's most powerful kingdom. As you may recall, it was Eumenes II who'd engineered the return of Antiochus IV to Syria, which had made the two kingdoms at least quasi-allies. But now that Demetrius had overthrown that faction, the alliance was null and void. Heracleides didn't have to do much convincing to get Eumenes on board. As Diodorus reports, on his arrival at Pergamon, the king tricked Alexander out with a diadem and the other insignia proper to a king, then sent him to a certain Cilician named Xenophanes. He received the youth in a town in Cilicia, 
and spread the word abroad in Syria that the youth would reclaim his father's kingdom in his own good time. The boy was conventionally known as Alexander Ballas, where Ballas may have been his mother's family name. When Demetrius first heard these rumors, he likely dismissed them, because, honestly, he felt pretty secure, and at the time, he was really more focused on Cappadocia. There's a pretty confusing cluster of intrigues, but it seems to break down like this. Demetrius had a sister named Laodice, who'd been married to King Perseus of Macedon before that king's defeat and death, and was now back living in Syria. So in 160, Demetrius had offered her hand in marriage to the new Cappadocian king, Ariarathes V. Which is a pretty nice gesture, and a good way to forge a peaceful alliance, but Ariarathes flat out refused. As an, I'm going to say, consolation prize, Demetrius then married his sister himself, and Laodice became Queen Laodice V of Syria. According to Granger, the marriage was at least partly due to the lack of eligible royal ladies and the pressing need to perpetuate the Seleucid line. But either way, the whole affair left a bad taste in Demetrius's mouth. The reason for the rejection soon became clear. According to Diodorus, Ariarathes V sent envoys to Rome with a crown of 10,000 gold pieces to inform the Senate of the king's friendly attitude toward the Roman people, as well as his renunciation, on their account, of an alliance of marriage and friendship with Demetrius. Which, well, there you go. Either way, it was a pretty strong hand, but Demetrius decided to raise it, sending along a matching donation along with a special bonus, the murderer of Gnaeus Octavius, the Roman commissioner who'd been assassinated in Syria after the whole hamstringing of the elephants affair. According to Diodorus, the Romans took the money but not the prisoner and gave Demetrius a cool response. While sending Ariarathes the highest gifts that it was their custom to bestow. For Demetrius, this was kind of the final insult. Demetrius conspired with Ariarathes' brother, Orophernes, to stage a Cappadocian coup, and Ariarathes was expelled from his kingdom and forced into exile in Greece. Orophernes then made two attempts to assassinate his brother, both of which failed, and Ariarathes eventually made his way back to Pergamon. By this time, Operation Alexander had been set in motion, and, more significantly, King Eumenes II had recently died, and been succeeded by his brother, Atalos II. Atalos was nearly his brother's age, and had lived through the same history, fought in the same conflicts, and was similarly geared toward doing his utmost to undermine King Demetrius. Also like his brother, there was zero daylight between his actions and the will of Rome, who, in this case, wanted Ariarathes restored. Details are elusive, but Polybius reports that, after reigning for a short time in Cappadocia, in utter contempt of the customs of his country, Orophernes perished and was expelled from his kingdom. Ariarathes was soon back in power, and, even more than Rome or Pergamon, had a compelling personal interest in seeing Demetrius destroyed. Meanwhile, down in Syria, Demetrius had to be frustrated. With looming threats in Anatolia, he couldn't really head off east to recover more Seleucid territory, but he also had that I was going to say gene, but it's more like social conditioning that drove him to seek new conquests. So, in the mid-150s BC, he embarked on a dangerous plan. Demetrius bribed the Ptolemaic governor of the island of Cyprus, a man named Archaeus, to betray the island into his hands. 
Archaeus was apparently caught in the act and hung himself on the way to his trial. But not before word got out about the Syrian king's involvement. Up to this time, Ptolemy VI had had no particular position on Demetrius. But after this, he was firmly in the opposition column. Not that Demetrius was Ptolemy's primary concern. No, that role had pretty much been designated at birth to a chubby younger brother named Physcon. Around the same time as Demetrius's attempted land grab, Ptolemy had apparently gotten tired of waiting for the next betrayal and sent assassins to kill his brother in Cyrenaica. How did it go? Um, not at all well. According to Polybius, the next thing you know, there was Physcon standing in front of the Roman Senate, denouncing his wicked brother Ptolemy, and laying on him the blame of the attack against his life. He showed the scars of his wounds and, speaking with all the bitterness which they seemed to suggest, moved his listeners to pity him. When Ptolemy's envoys showed up in Rome, the Senate wouldn't even hear their side and told them they could just sail right back to Egypt. For the third time, the Senate told Physcon, we fully support you taking Cyprus. They even told all their regional allies to do whatever they could to help. And, well, third time's the charm, so Physcon may have liked his chances. But before he took his leave of Rome, he had one more scene to make. And these are the kind of tidbits that make ancient history so fun. So, I mentioned that when Demetrius escaped his Roman captivity, among the officials sent to keep an eye on him was Tiberius Gracchus, the father of the famous Gracchi brothers. Tiberius Gracchus was married to Cornelia Africana, the daughter of Scipio Africanus, so pretty much the closest thing Rome had to royalty. As it happened, Tiberius Gracchus had died that same year. 154 BC, at the age of 63. Cornelia herself was 36, and the epitome of Roman virtue. Devoting herself to the care of her sons, nine-year-old Tiberius and the newborn Gaius. So it's hard to imagine how surprised they were when the 28-year-old Ptolemy Physcon, viceroy of Cyrenaica and friend of the Roman Senate, requested an audience. Physcon likely entered the atrium, thanked Cornelia for her hospitality, complimented her home, offered his condolences on her husband's death, tousled Tiberius's hair, tickled Gaius under the chin, you know the drill. But eventually, he came to the point. And what was the point? Well, Ptolemy Physcon requested the honor of Cornelius' hand in marriage, basically offering to make her co-ruler of Cyrenaica and make Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus into Ptolemaic princes. Of all the alternate timelines to explore, this has to be one of the funnest. I mean, just picture the brothers becoming the firebrands of North African land reform— or maybe just plotting to kill each other like Ptolemy and Physcon. But while it's fun to pretend, back in the real world, there was just no way Cornelia would ever say yes. She was Roman. Hell, she was Rome. And to her eyes, the shiniest Ptolemaic crown was no more than a garish trinket. Physcon left Rome a bit deflated, but you know what they say, nothing soothes the pain of rejection like a naval attack on Cyprus. I may be misquoting. So, did Physcon end up capturing Cyprus? That'd be a no. And I have to be honest, I'm sure it's a very pretty island, but is it really worth all this effort? I don't know, maybe I'm just not good Ptolemaic prince material. Anyway, on this occasion, Physcon got captured by his brother, the now 32-year-old King Ptolemy VI. 
But now that he actually had him in his hands, he just couldn't bring himself to kill him. Instead, he made one final attempt to win his brother's loyalty. Hearing that he was in the marrying mood, Ptolemy offered him the hand of his daughter, Fizcon's own niece, the ten-year-old Cleopatra Thea. And those of you who are shocked by Roman behavior, the Ptolemies think you're adorable. Anyway, Fizcon accepted, the two were engaged, and went off together to Cyrenaica. No matter how crazy all this was, it was about to go to eleven. Because this same year, Heracleides sailed from Anatolia to Rome, bringing with him the young Alexander Ballas and his sister Laodice. Polybius reports that Heracleides used all the arts of cunning and corruption to win the support of the Senate, likely including substantial donations from his backers in Pergamon and Cappadocia. When the time was ripe, he brought Alexander to speak to the Senate, where the 13-year-old prince begged the Romans to remember their friendship and alliance with his father, Antiochus, and if possible, to assist him to recover his kingdom. Heracleides had done sterling work, because the Senate issued a decree giving Alexander and Laodice authority to return to the kingdom of their forefathers and help, in accordance with their request, is hereby decreed to them. Polybius notes that Heracleides immediately began hiring mercenaries. He then went to Ephesus and devoted himself to the preparations for his attempt. All things considered, the usurpation of Antiochus IV and the counter-coup of Demetrius I had been relatively bloodless affairs aside from the targeted murder of critical relatives and regents. But what Heracleides and his supporters were planning was something far more dangerous. They knew that Demetrius was a legitimate king who'd held the throne for eight years. Dislodging him would not be easy, and could mean exposing Syria to the horrors of civil war. 